If I could, I'd call our meeting to order. I appreciate everyone being here this evening. Uh, the first item on our agenda is to call our meeting to order and establish a quorum. All of our board teams here, so I appreciate everyone being here and us being able to start on time. Um, the next item on our agenda is our invocation. We're honored this evening to have Jay Johnston. He's the uh, Johnson, the pastor at Cowboy Church in San Angelo, and he's going to lead us in our invocation. Let's pray. Father God, we just come to you, Lord, and we do thank you for this day. And we just come together to acknowledge that you are God and you're the strong one who sees and hears, Lord. And we thank you for your mercy and your grace, Lord. Father, we just pray as we come together, pray for these leaders, Lord, as they come to, to make decisions, Lord, uh, uh, for, the, for, for this community, uh, for the kids, Lord, for parents and for faculty and, uh, and all that's involved, Lord. So, God, I just pray, God, we know that you have a plan, and, but you ask us to do the legwork. So I just pray, Father, for wisdom, Lord. I pray for knowledge. I pray for discernment. I pray for awareness, Lord, that in decision-making process that we would just not choose what is good but what is excellence, Lord. So we put our faith and trust in you in all of these things, and we thank you for your promise where you never leave us, you never forget about us, and every perfect promise of our salvation in Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, Pastor. We appreciate that. Okay, our next items are pledges, and I'm going to welcome our students from San Jacinto Elementary as they come forward. So we have Kaysen Bowie, Sierra Hudson, Sophia Rudolph, Gigi Roman, and Lulu Alfaro. So, so let's stand up. And if I told the, all these beautiful young ladies that if their parents wanted to come up and take a picture, they could come up and get a little closer. So y'all come on up and uh, y'all pose appropriately, okay? Great job, young ladies. I, I always remind them that they have to start and they have to be loud so that I can hear. You know, so they did both those excellently. So we appreciate uh, them being here this evening. I'll go ahead and read our script um, before we uh, go any further. I appreciate um, everyone being here. Good evening and welcome. As the president of the Board of Trustees of the San Angelo Independent School District, I'd like to welcome all of you who are present at tonight's regular uh, school board meeting. I also welcome those of you who might be watching the tape of this meeting on our public access channel, Channel 4. We appreciate your interest in our students. All items that will be discussed at our, even this, at our meeting this evening have been posted as required by state law. Also, as you may be aware, our board meets a minimum of two times per month, and most, if not all, the items on our agenda this evening have been previously discussed at an earlier pre-agenda board workshop. As members of the San Angelo Independent School District's Board of Trustees, we're here to set goals, listen to reports from our superintendent, approve budgets, contracts, and personnel appointments, and to make policy for the school district. Please keep in mind that our meeting is a meeting of the Board of Trustees held in public and not a meeting of the public. However, with that in mind, we have an item on each, we have an item on every one of our meeting agendas that allows every, anyone present who wishes to speak to our board team an opportunity to do so. I also will make certain to give everyone an opportunity to speak on any item not listed on our agenda. Additionally, prior to taking any votes, I will ask audience members if they would like to make any comments. Anyone wishing to make comments to our board team on any agenda item should be, do their best to limit their comments to three to five minutes. In compliance with Texas state law, these proceedings are recorded and will become a part of San Angelo Independent School District's permanent legal record. In order that the tape might adequately reflect the proceedings, I ask that you please refrain from talking while others might be speaking. And I'll also ask, as, as I remind my fellow board team members, to please turn off or silence your cell phones at this particular time. 
Again, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's meeting and to thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. We appreciate your interest in the activities of our students and the business of our school district. Um, our next item is item four, recognitions, and I believe uh, Mr. Jackson is going to help us with that. Thanks, Derek. Good evening, Mr. Lehman, Dr. Detloff, members of the board. Tonight I have the privilege of presenting this very special recognition. We're going to recognize our desk board. The people on the desk board are very special to us here, and they mean a lot to us here in St. Angelo ISD. Back in 2004, their president and founder, Eric Wilson, had an idea, knowing there was a need in our district for students who did not have school supplies. Mr. Wilson decided that he would form a board of concerned citizens, and they would set about to raise funds for students of SAISD who were in need of those supplies. This year, our desk board gave students of St. Angelo ISD through its campuses school supply money in the amount of $55,000. $58.65. For those who may not know, DESK stands for Donate Educational Supplies to Kids. The organization since its inception has raised and given to campuses in our district more than $650,000 for the purpose of meeting the needs of those in the district who are unable to purchase their own school supplies. Each campus in the district each year receives a percentage of the total amount of money raised based on the number of students who receive assistance through our free and reduced meal program. At the annual desk presentation each August, campus administrators are given their funds so that supplies may be purchased before the school year begins. This evening, we're honored to have several members of the desk board with us. So Dr. Detloff, would you please come forward and help me recognize the desk board members who are here in attendance this evening? And desk board members, when we call your name, please come forward and Dr. Detloff will present your certificate and we would like for you to stay as well for a group photo, and then our board members and administrators would like to greet you and say thank you. So, with that said, we will begin with Eric Wilson. <laughs> All righty. We'll do a group photo after, so we'll get them all. So. <laughs> Next up, Vicki Loso. Thank you, sir. Diane Wilson. Jacqueline Ochoa. Not in attendance, okay. I didn't he was here, sorry about that. John Flint, I didn't see John around there. I think we can get that in the hands. <laughs> Andy Mayer, not here. Elizabeth Jost, we have a couple that did not attend, I apologize. Kathy Self, David Wagner, is he here? Well, I know Cheryl's here, Cheryl Book. <laughs> Let me get to the ones I know are here. <laughs> All right, that looks like that's gonna be our group for the photo. Thank you all. You want to get, let's go around the horn and shake hands here real quick. <laughs> that's right. You're not done just yet. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yes, that's it. Nope. We didn't have as many in the tent. And Mr. Lehman, that concludes our recognition. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we appreciate that group so much. And they, it seems like every year they, they raise more and more money for our students. So thank y'all. We appreciate y'all's efforts. And pretty amazing, six hundred and fifty over $650,000. So thank y'all. And uh, our next item, and I think we do have someone wishing to make comments to our board team, is for 
anyone wishing to make comments on topics not on our agenda this evening, I have uh, Miss Jennifer Wallace wishing to do so. So when you get up, Jennifer, if you'd make sure you uh, use that mic over there and announce who you are. And uh, we are very appreciative of you taking time to be here this evening. So thank you. Thank you all for allowing me to have a few minutes sure. of your time. Um, I am a mother of three wonderful children. Um, my son is a um, central grad um, from 2010 and um, went on to ASU and is a graduate from Angelo State as well. Um, I have a junior at Central who is a third year uh, varsity cheerleader and also a third year varsity gymnast. Um, and then I have my sweet Lauren, um, who is a special education student in the ninth grade at um, Lincoln Middle School. And I am here tonight on Lauren's behalf. Um, my other two children are who they are today because of the things they have been involved in in school throughout their lives. And I'm here tonight to encourage and help promote special education to develop programs so that our children have other opportunities to grow. I didn't prepare anything to say tonight because this is definitely from my heart. And I'm not just speaking on Lauren's behalf. This is for the other students whose parents are not here tonight or can't come, um, but also may not have the faith that I have in our school system. I want to see us grow and I want to see us improve and I want to see us do better. I know that the special education department grew tremendously this year. And what a better opportunity for us now to take that and make this into something great and uh, want people to come to San Angelo to be a part of something that's good. Um, I believe in our school and I believe in all of y'all. And so when Stephanie or uh, Denise Boyles is, is helping to push, um, it's because of me. It's because I'm pushing them. Um, because I want to see change and I want to see things happen for the better for our students um, in the special education program. So thank you all for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Wallace. We appreciate you being here and uh, be speaking on behalf of so many of our students. So thank you. Um, okay, let's move forward to our minutes, the approval of our minutes. And I, um, I, I think you know this already, but we can't specifically address anything that you discussed this evening because it's not on our agenda. But uh, certainly as we move forward, I know we'll keep your comments in mind and uh, our team, our administrative team, uh, will will certainly um, accept the challenge. You know, so thank you. Um, our next item is approval of our minutes. Do we have a motion to approve our minutes of our August meetings? Move to approve. So we have a motion from Mr. Hernandez and a second from Mr. Parker to approve the minutes of our August 13th special finance and pre-agenda uh, workshop meeting, our August 20th, 2018 regular board meeting, and our August 27th, 2018 special meeting. Are there any comments um, concerning our minutes or any additions or corrections that you'd like to make to our minutes? If not all in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Our next item is for reports. Uh, I checked with Ms. Harmon. I think we're okay on um, Goodfella. Um, our next item is B on our reports update on academic progress. Um, and I think Ms. Dr. Ritter is going to help us with that. Thank you, Mr. Lehman, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. So I'm going to be combining those two items on the agenda today. Um, the first thing you have there, this larger page, is our strategic plan, the one pager of our strategic plan that our district, we have just finished completing. We started this process in um, October of 2017 and proceeded through uh, September 2018 with final approval that will be October 2018. Um, so I'm giving this to you now so that many of you sat on some committees and provided some input and feedback for us through this process that involved 
over 200 community, parent, and district representatives on all of these different areas and the categories of teaching for learning, innovation, human capital, funding and finance, facilities, communications and community involvement. So um, in these areas, we have the objectives, strategies, action plans, and then the years, the years of planning there for implementation in these areas. So um, I just encourage you to review this. You'll have an electronic copy also provided to you. And we will be, I will be soliciting some input from you also. And if you have questions, you're welcome to contact me. We'll be presenting this in final form next month in our October board meeting. So I want to highlight the, the two areas of teaching for learning and innovation. Um, as we do academic reports, it's important for us to connect everything we do with our strategic plan that we, are, that we have developed. And with the objectives of all students being actively engaged and invested in their learning to grow academically and become future ready graduates under teaching for learning. I wanted to, and also under innovation, inspiring students to be invested in their learning. I wanted to highlight on the academic update here that you have in front of you also. And I'm just, there's so much that I wanted to share with you today that I'm just going to go through these items and I gave you the hard copy so that you have that to, to follow along with me. Do y'all have that one, this white page here? Okay. Um, first of all, I think we just, I wanted to brag on our district a little bit, and it's not on this page, but in line with our teaching for learning, I um, wanted to highlight that even just today, we received notification from the Texas Association of School Administrators that we have been selected as the leading district in the state in utilizing our curriculum audit and our processes to drive district improvement in teaching for learning. Um, I will be representing our district and presenting this with TASA at the upcoming TASA TASB School Board Conference. Um, and they're wanting us to focus on how we've utilized our curriculum audit to proceed with curriculum writing that we started three years ago. Um, and impl the implementation process, the revision is a continuous improvement process. With the thing that stands out for our district is how we're utilizing also our future ready learner profile and really embedding that into everything that we do. And so we'll be presenting, I will be presenting that with TASA um, this next in two weeks, I guess, when we go for the TASA TASBE School Board Conference. Um, we're also currently finalizing our parent community platform. Um, this will be ready in, for access for our parent community by December of 2018. Again, a component of our curriculum writing process that's very important to us so that we know that we have transparency in what we're doing in curriculum that we're also very aligned with our state standards and our high priority learning standards for the district in, law, in line with our future ready learner profile. So that's just a little area of pride for us as a district and we're looking forward to that and informing you more on all of that. Um, with our academic update tonight, what I wanted to highlight here, um, we've just had a lot of processes happening with the beginning of the school year. We just completed a continuous improvement data dig we are going to complete this with all of our campuses. We did about half of our campuses last week um, at the Region 15 Education Service Center led by David Bedford, who is, he works with the school improvement department there. And really this was in order for us to take campus leadership teams through a deep dive into their data on their campus from their previous year star data. The campus leadership teams, which include administrators, ICs, and several lead teachers from each campus. They were scheduled, that we were um, focusing on effective leadership through a growth mindset lens and closely examined our campus data to discover areas of strength and areas of focus for targeted strategies and actions. Completed a root cause analysis to understand specific needs of student groups, as well as to determine effective responses for improvement efforts and every campus team through this process developed a plan of action to clearly articulate the next steps in providing support and focus for each targeted area. As a response to this, um, our administrative team of Dr. Detloff, Shelley Holohan, Matt Kimball, myself, and the executive director for each campus, we've started the rounds of our um, academic focus leadership meetings, starting with those campuses that we just finished our data digs on. We've met with the campus administration, held at each of those campuses, and, um, I just included the questions that we've gone over with them, more of a conversation 
around what were the ahas through that process. Each campus principal reflected on their day to day and responded to these questions that I've provided you here. Just really, what were the main discoveries, the highlights, the top three focus areas that your team identified, the responses you determined, including activities and strategies for these focus areas, and how will the principal be leading the monitoring and implementation of strategies on the campus? So we've had some excellent conversations with our campus administrators, and what we've come away with from that is a feeling of excitement. They feel very supported by the district in the areas of math and reading with our literacy initiative as well, and um, so it's, it's really nice to be able to go in and help support them and to hear from them how they're planning on utilizing that support, and they're very appreciative of your support as well. On the back of this page, I just gave some specifics to our literacy initiative, we are, right now we're working with um, scholastics, our, we have consultants who've been on the elementary middle school campuses last week and this week to meet with them, provide job embedded coaching for every elementary middle school reading teacher in the district. Our teachers are being provided feedback regarding implementation of best practices and guided reading and balanced literacy. And our curriculum team is working alongside them to be able to carry this out in the coaching with fidelity throughout the school year. We also have level book room materials and digital planning tools that our teachers are being trained in so that they can more effectively plan lessons designed around the customized needs of our students and their reading levels. Um, our numeracy initiative, which is math, our, we, are, we, have, we have observers right now on campuses this week to observe math instruction in our classrooms, K through 12. And we have coaches developing a customized plan of action for every campus and moving forward with instructional best practice. These coaches will meet with teachers throughout the school year to provide job embedded coaching to increase the use of research proven practices. Again, we feel that um, in focusing in these areas this year with our new curriculum, with our future ready learner profile, that we're really headed in a great direction. Our teachers feel very supported and our principals are very excited about this support. And lastly here, we're gonna highlight the measure of academic progress assessment, our MAP testing that we are going to be implementing this year. We've talked about it some with you. These are growth tests. It's a measure to help us understand what students know and what, in, what they are ready to, and informs us as to what they are ready to learn next. By adjusting to their responses, the MAP tests create a personal assessment experience that accurately measures performance. Timely, easy to use reports help teachers teach, students learn, and administrators lead. They are aligned to state standards. They provide proficiency projection and probability for passing the STAR. And they, it allows teachers to individualize differentiation for student needs. So through this, we will have our students in grades second grade through eighth grade for this year in reading and math and in science and some of those grade levels so that we can really assess where our students are. So we're looking forward to this data and it will help us to see the growth that our students are experiencing aligned with our curriculum and state standards. And we look forward to reporting more on this to you in the future. So I know that's a lot of information, but we've been doing a lot since school started. So are there any questions? Thanks, Dr. Renner. Any questions, uh, Dr. Kingman? I would just say I'm, I'm glad we're actually using this data to actually, and going through the implementation, it's a great job for the whole administrative team to be going through and actually using this data with the new curriculum and all the tools we have to actually implement things that are hopefully going to make a lot of improvement for our kids. So great job. Thank you. And thank you for asking the Region 15 service center to get involved with this as well. Absolutely. They've done a fabulous job. We are partnering with them and we have another round of campuses that we will be going through um, October the 4th to do the same process, and then we'll com continue with our academic focus meetings that we'll be having with those administrators. Yes, Dr. Just, Detloff. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I just want, <clears throat> Mr. you said Parker. something that wasn't on our paperwork. We, we were chosen what? Then we're getting, <laughs> uh, I know this is, this is new information. I knew we were gonna be called on, but I didn't know that we actually are a, the district that was selected to, to present this with TASA as the district that they've identified um, to really, who, that we've gone through. We've gone through this entire process that we have a true five-year plan with a strategic plan in place that we're following through with that with fidelity, with support. And um, 
they're just very impressed by that and that we have our Future Ready Learner profile that we continually embed into the work that we're doing. So it has to do with, we had our curriculum audit years ago, a few years ago, and we have made sure we have addressed those areas. We have rewritten the curriculum, we have revised it, implemented, and we are moving forward with everything that we have, we have found that needed to be need to be adjusted and addressed. And so now we have that aligned curriculum across our district. We actually today had the round, this is the last round of curriculum writing for the group of, this is fine art, all the fine arts groups, um, electives, including um, what am I trying, languages other than, than English. So our Spanish was here as well today. And um, any outlying groups that we've had, like we, like some of our, um, higher level science, higher level math, higher level social studies classes that were here as well today. And they were very excited to be included in this process. But, and then secondly, you said at the, the school board convention that we're all going to, we've yes. been to several of those, that you will be in one of the breakout sessions? Um, yes. I mean, I one think of it's the sessions session. that when we go, the, the persons watching this don't understand it, when we go to the school board convention, there are, um, different programs that we can choose from um, maybe every hour hour and a half uh, to get our continuing hours of training and we can choose those programs and we're there is going to be one of those programs going to be presented by you on what you just talked about yes yes so that's a to me that's a pretty big deal because i don't remember my 14 years being on the board that we actually san angelo independent school district has presented one of the programs so yes. if that's what we're doing, give yourself a pat on the back and the group that you've been working on, because that's something to really be proud of. Thank you. We also, it's not on here, but we're all, we were also selected to um, present with our uh, working with community-based accountability system. We're in the kind of groundwork of that work with uh, the Texas Performance, well, the Texas Public Accountability Consortium that our district is participating in through TASA as well. And our district's done quite a, work, quite a bit of work uh, Farrah Gomez, Dean Munn, Jason Skelton, and Michael Kallenbach attend those sessions with me when we go, and we're actually working to help build community-based accountability in the state of Texas, and we'll, I'll be there presenting on that as well. Two programs. Yes, sir. <laughs> Pat yourself on the back twice. That's a, that's a big deal. And then you Good have to job. come to our sessions. One of them's at 7.30 in the morning, so... <laughs> That's perfect. Max gets up early, so that's perfect. Don't yes. worry. <laughs> any qu any other, Doctor Doctor Detloff? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Lame. Uh, first, Doctor Ritter, I just want to highlight uh, the work of our entire curriculum instruction staff and department. Mm -hmm. uh, we have many pockets of academic excellence in this district. We also have some spots that we need uh, to target for assistance. Um, so I appreciate you using the curriculum audit as the foundation to that. Uh, more so, I also want to highlight that our Board of Trustees has reallocated the resources to match the need. So a few weeks ago, we have uh, provided the resources and the funding to match the academic need. So uh, before, we were really good at targeting a specific campus that, that struggled academically and moving them out of that struggle. Uh, however, uh, the more we work to be proactive, we are now utilizing those same support mechanisms across the entire district. So uh, we are touching all of our elementary schools to catch them before they struggle academically. So uh, I want to highlight the board's effort of, of uh, the allocation of resources to, to match the need uh, because we are about academic performance. Uh, and again, we have pockets of excellence and we are striving to close those achievement gaps. So uh, thank you and your staff for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you for your support. Thanks, Dr. Ditloff. Any other comments or questions from our board team? Thanks, um, Dr. Ritter. We appreciate that. Okay, and I think you. our... She combined reports B and C. Uh, so now we have uh, our next reports D, which is on human resource and professional development update. And Mr. Kimball's gonna do that for us. Matt, thanks for uh, being here. Good evening, uh, Dr. Detloff, Ms. Lehman, members of the board. Uh, I've analyzed hours and hours and hours of board meeting uh, video um, over channel four. And one of the things I realized if we strategically placed the learner profile over my right shoulder, 
Jack the cameraman can catch it on TV. So we're hoping that our audience that's not here at least gets to see a glimpse of our learner profile on TV. So I'm counting on you, Jack. Um, as uh, Dr. Ritter mentioned, um, we've got the strategic plan that she talked to you about. Uh, in 3.1, it talks about de design innovative and flexible training processes. So today, tonight, I just wanted to highlight uh, some of the amazing uh, professional learning uh, that occurred in our district this past summer uh, and that is also continuing through, through the school year. Uh, so this is all the things that uh, our teachers participated in that were district created. Uh, they also attended things on their own, college courses and those kinds of things, but these are district designed items. We started in June uh, with our partnership with TAS and the Selectee Center. Uh, we have the Selectee Design Camp. Uh, we've had groups go to design camp before, but we actually brought them here, and we had about 60 to 75 teachers that participated in two days of, of work and designing engaging activities, engaging work for students. So instead of focusing on teacher design lesson plans, it was really designing that work around their who, around their students. And so Vicki Phelps and Nancy Rendoni Downey were here. Um, they focused on design qualities, and uh, teachers were introduced to that, and they walked away with a redesigned unit of study for their, their students. And we had, like I said, about 70 teachers that were participating in that. Then June 12th through 14th, we had Learning Palooza. We've had that for many years. Uh, we've expanded it over time. Uh, this is uh, offered by many of our own um, outstanding teachers in the school district. Um, they are identified. Sometimes we have to to convince them to come present, but uh, they all, all do a great job. They come and do some training on presenting, and then they present over those three days. We had 58 sessions with more than 65 uh, of our current school district teachers that presented on everything from guided reading, project-based learning, write, written uh, curriculum updates that were done last year, daily five, math workshop. We had over 2,300 hours of professional learning uh, time uh, accrued by the teachers that participated in that. Then in the latter part of June, 19th through 20th, we had Engage Technology Conference. Uh, there were 98 sessions over those two days. Uh, we had not only our own school district presenters, um, teachers that were, are doing amazing things in the classroom, but we also had uh, presenters from across the nation. We even had a 10-year-old uh, that does an amazing, amazing job. I think I've mentioned her before uh, at the Live Bits. We heard her uh, with Alan November at a conference, and she is amazing talking to kids about what they can do uh, with their learning and communicating that online. Uh, so we had some outstanding sessions, uh, very well received, um, everything from student choice with technology, makerspace areas, coding for kids, uh, digital stations, and we had over 250 of our own employees that attended and 3,000 hours of credit that were received. So that's pretty amazing, a lot of learning. Um, sometimes I think our public doesn't realize that teachers are working all summer long too, so that's important. Something that we added new this year, uh, we added a STEM camp for students. Uh, we, this started with it as an idea to have a kids conference along with our technology conference, and it turned into a STEM camp. Um, Roxanne Fentress, Michelle Beers, Cass Jennings were three teachers that worked with Laura Howard and Jennifer Feck to plan and design that day. Uh, I think Ms. Mazelle Flint got her kids in that, and, and I think they enjoyed that. We had uh, 353 students applied, and uh, we had over 100 elementary students that were accepted, and 74 middle school students that were accepted. We're looking to expand it so we can accept more next year. We had 11 teachers. Um, this was all sponsored by the San Angelo Schools Foundation, 100%, and that made it free for students. So they came, they got a, a day of learning around STEM, they had free t-shirts, they got pizza for lunch, can't beat pizza, had some snacks in there as well, and they left with uh, an item to take home and, and work on their own. Um, and again, that was sponsored by the Schools Foundation. And Matt, I before going any further, don't use as many acronyms, so let everybody know what STEM means. You know, so. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Technology. Engineering, and Math. Thank My you. apologies. Yeah. Thank you.
that was just a brief video. The, the website that's located in your packet will take you to a much longer video that highlights uh, a variety of activities, everything from coding to rocketry. Um, they even did a solar oven activity, so a lot of different activities that involved science, technology, engineering, and math uh, at the camp. <laughs> On July 27th, we had an administrator's retreat. Again, uh, uh, Nancy Rendoni and Vicki Phelps came back and worked with our principals around design qualities. And the, the neat thing about this day was not only did they get to focus on the design qualities uh, that we look for uh, as we design work for our students, but they got to put it into practice as they designed professional learning uh, in, on August 16th. They designed for that day for their staff. So they put in those design qualities into to practice as they designed around the district initiatives and uh, key focuses of our district uh, when they came back to school with, with their, um, their teachers. July 30th, we had Coaching Greatness. Uh, Brad McCoy and Scott Candela were here from the Flipping Group. Uh, this is a complimentary program that we did with uh, 97 of our athletic coaches in the school district. Uh, it complements uh, capturing kids' hearts and um, really is a powerful tool for our coaches to get involved and support uh, the work that we've done with that arena. That was over two days, uh, and the coaches, uh, many of them said that was one of the best trainings they had attended, and so it was a, a great success. Uh, following that, we had on August 1st and 2nd, Capturing Kids Hearts Leadership Blueprint. Uh, our leadership team and principals went through this last year, and so this year we were able to have our instructional coaches and our assistant principals attend as well. So 48 attended those sessions, um, focus on quality leadership through purposeful actions and reflective consideration of personal growth. And again, that aligns with uh, Capturing Kids Hearts and the work that we're doing uh, with that in our classrooms. August 9th, 10th, and 13th, we had our New Teacher Academy, over 150, I think it was actually approaching 200 new teachers um, participated uh, in sessions focused on uh, our key initiatives, our, our uh, high pri priority standards, our s successful uh, teaching strategies such as Marzano's um, strategies and, and much more, uh, focused to get them on board and get them ready to start the year, as well as a T-Test, which stands for the Texas Teacher Evaluation and Support System. That's their evaluation system that we use for, for teachers. August 15th was our Teaching for Learning Day in the district. Uh, this was district-wide. We had uh, math and science teachers participated in curriculum rollout. That was new curriculum that was written last year. So they participated in learning about that curriculum, getting into the documents, uh, making sure they understood it so that they could begin planning with th this year. Uh, language, uh, arts, social studies, Foreign language teachers spent time planning and giving feedback on the, their new curriculum, and those were offered by curriculum writers and administrators across the district and focused on our teaching for learning plan, uh, the guaranteed and viable curriculum at the top, focused professional development on the side, uh, professional learning co committee, com community in the middle, and, and data. August 16th, as I mentioned earlier, principals designed this day using design qualities in mind, uh, focus on our district initiatives, Capturing Kids' Hearts, the Learner Profile, Design Qualities, Engaging Students. And so these were conducted on the campuses, but centered around those important district initiatives across the district. And then August 20th was also a District Professional Development Day. Um, Dr. Ritter mentioned the work that we're doing with Mass Solutions and Scholastic, and this was an initial kickoff for some of that. Uh, we had elementary uh, teachers focus on guided reading as well as on math, and we added that up through our middle schools as well. Um, our writing initiative has been going on for several years. Uh, Farrah Gomez has been working with our teachers on that, and we pushed that up into our English 1 and English 2 uh, teachers as well to, to make sure that we have our vertically aligned uh, processes for writing instruction. And we'll continue that work uh, throughout this year. And so that was a very full summer of lots of professional learning and, and a lot that are going on this year. Uh, continuing with math solutions, scholastic writing training, level literacy intervention kits. So we've got a lot going on and, and our teachers are finding a lot of value in it. Any questions for Mr. Kimball? Yeah, go ahead, um, Amy. First, I just wanted to say that for those who think that teachers have the summer off, this is proof <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> um, and if we could just go back to the STEM camp for one second. Um, so my nine-year-old, or my eight-year-old and my 13-year-old both participated and had a, a fabulous time. They loved it. 
um, still talk about the different activities they did, you know, two months later. And the only complaint that they had was that it was only one day long. Yes. So, so, but I wanted to just take this time to publicly thank the school's foundation for um, sponsoring that for us because it was a wonderful program and we look forward to participating again next year. Thanks, uh, Amy. Other comments or questions for, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Lehman. Uh, again, I just want to recognize Patty Griffin and Matt Kimball in the Human Resources and Professional Learning Department for what they do. It's, it's a multi-layered approach uh, to have student success. And so uh, the executive directors in this room, uh, Dr. Bright, our assistant superintendents, uh, it takes everyone to generate uh, student success. So I'm very appreciative uh, of all the work our, our staff does. There is not a day that goes by that we don't spend two to three hours of that day focusing on student success and student academic performance. Uh, as you've heard this evening, it basically boils down to, to a, a couple of items. First, building relationships with kids. And also, as we know, extracurricular activities build relationships with kids, whether they're in band, choir, uh, soccer, volleyball, or on the gridiron uh, Friday nights or the dance team. It's those extracurricular items that also build relationships with kids. The uh, leadership profile, the capturing kids' hearts, all that helps keep, keep kids in school. And we know that when kids are building relationships, they're participating in school activities, they're safer, their GPA is higher, their attendance rate is higher, and their graduation rate is higher uh, when they're involved in school. So we want to keep kids involved in school, uh, and at the same time, uh, that involvement leads to higher academic performance. So I just want to thank all the, uh, the staff that we have that are working diligently for the success of kids every day. Uh, also, Mr. Kimball, uh, our learner profile, I think, sets kids up for success, you know, in, in the modern era, because I think if you look at uh, any of the attributes of a learner, uh, these attributes are the same attributes that organizations, the military, uh, trade certifications are all looking for uh, in kids as they hire them, as they move on and become successful citizens. And all those, there are only four, uh, the four C's of the learner profile. I was at a meeting the other day and for some reason I added a fifth. Uh, and I said civic capacity. So that's a good one, but maybe we can add that later. Uh, I'm not quite sure where that came from. But uh, the learner profile is just a, a great, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a lighthouse for us. It's, it's the guiding light of, of student achievement. So uh, I just want to thank everyone and our board again for putting the resources where the needs are. Other questions or comments? Thanks, Matt. We appreciate that update. And certainly as Amy mentioned, uh, you know, our, our students... Uh, some of our students are busy in the, su in the summer, but certainly our teachers and administrators and others are more busy in the summer. So we appreciate uh, their commitment uh, to our students. Uh, our next re item is Report E. It's uh, provided in our Friday Facts. This is from uh, the eighth day of school. We're uh, much further along than that, but on the eighth day of school, uh, we had four more students than we did on the eighth day of school last year. Uh, so we're doing pretty well there. We appreciate um, the, and the confidence that the community has in, uh, in allowing us the opportunity to educate their children. So uh, we'll move forward to our consent items. Uh, do we have a motion to approve consent items A through uh, F? Move for approval of consent items A through, through e. e. I'm sorry. Second. So we have a motion from it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my eyesight, my eyesight's really bad tonight, so it, looked, it looks like an F, but it's, I thought D and then F, so um, A through F. So thanks, we have a motion from Mr. Dindle and a second from Mr. Gallegos, I believe. So um, our first item, we've listed uh, those that have made contributions and donations. Um, we appreciate uh, their, uh, those donations and their interest in our, our students. I'd especially like, wanted to mention uh, several of the uh, contributions made by the West Texas Ener Energy Consortium. We appreciate their support of our district. Also, uh, St. Luke's Methodist Church made a, a contribution on behalf of the uh, district. And then um, the Santa Rita PTO, uh, with the help of Caltech, Grigsby, Striblings, and San Angelo Gives, made a $20,000 contribution um, to uh, assist us with a structure um, a shade structure 
at um, Santa Rita. So we appreciate uh, those contributions uh, to our school district. Um, and certainly we thank the Lions Charities as well. So that's item A. Item B is to consider extracurricular um, status for 4-H organization and adjunct faculty agreement at uh, Texas A&M um, AgriLife Extension Service in Tom Green County. Item C is to consider election of services contract. Uh, item D is to consider bid number 18024, which is for wireless radio um, maintenance and repair. And item E is to consider repeal of all previously adopted policies and the adoption of local policies as prepared by our TASB policy review. Uh, so those are the items that we have on our um, consent agenda. As most people know in the room, and certainly we've um, previously mentioned this, but all those items were previously discussed at our, our pre-agenda board workshop. Uh, so does anybody have any questions or would like to remove any of the items A through E? If not, do we have any public comment concerning items A through E? If not, all in favor, please indicate our... By, by saying aye, aye. Any opposed indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. Item nine is to consider the firm to appeal the state comptroller's annual property value study, and Dr. Bright's going to review that with us. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we discussed at pre-agenda that normally this is just a routine item for us. We've done this uh, property value appeal for many years, as long as I can remember. Uh, group is called Lime Barger, and they come in and, the, and they'll appeal the property value study that the controller is going to do here re pretty quickly. But uh, the board felt like this was also an opportunity for us to kind of remind the public of how the uh, Texas school funding system operates. And the first thing we would want to do is, is share that uh, there is a big difference between the way property taxes operate on the city, county, and special taxing district level than they do on the school district level. And we know good and well that, and this is not a rub on the city and county or any of those districts, it's just how, how it is, uh, that those, in, those districts or those entities can leave their tax rate the same, and as long as values increase, which they generally do over time, they can generate more operational dollars. And, and then some will come back and wrongly claim that they didn't raise taxes, but we know good and well that they're, you know, the taxes are going up because of values. On the other side, school district property taxes are part of a funding system. It's a formula-driven system, and there's two pieces to it. One is property taxes, local property taxes, but the other piece of it is state funding. And it's a, it's a combination. Now, the amount of state funding or the amount of mix depends on how property wealthy you are. The less money you're able to generate locally, the more state dollars the state will put into your, what we, the analogy we use is a funding cup. Okay? Uh, you have your little funding cup. The first thing that goes in it is the local property taxes, and then the state fills your cup up with state dollars. Now, what happens on a systemic uh, basis is that as property values increase, you put more local tax dollars in your cup, but your cup doesn't grow. All the state does is simply reduce the amount they put in your cup to fill it. And uh, over time, this causes problems with the system because as property values grow, the state puts less money in the system and, uh, and pushes more of the burden to fund public schools on the backs of the local property taxpayers. And uh, like I said, over time, it, it gets out of whack and it could be upwards of 60% or more uh, of the funding is coming from the local property taxpayers. And as the values keep climbing, more of that burden gets pushed onto our local taxpayers. Um, some people say, well, is the system broke? Because the question is, what is the state doing with all that extra money that they're no longer having to put into the system? Well, that's a great question for your legislators. Uh, what generally tends to happen is they take the, the money and they either fund something else around state government or they may offer tax breaks to other groups than local property taxpayers, like businesses, like maybe through a business franchise tax reduction, those type of things. 
So, uh, so is the system broke? The answer is no and yes. No, it's not broke because it is functioning exactly like it's supposed to. As values climb, state puts in less money, system stays whole. Is it broke? Yes, because without an infusion of other tax dollars, the, the burden for paying for public schools is going to continue to be pushed on to local taxpayers. And there is a fix. The legislature can fix this, but they must have the will. And I'm not even saying add new money to the system. Just leave the same money in the system. You must replace the uh, local property taxes with some other form of state dollars. And right now, there's not a will to do that. It's much easier to just leave the system alone, let the local property taxes keep filling up those cups, and not have to, to pull taxes from other areas. Um, so how does Limebarger fit into all of this? Well, since since the amount of funding we receive is based on property values and the amount of property tax that we can generate, what they do is you have local values assigned by our local district. The state comes in and they sort of grade the appraisal district. And if it's within a certain confidence level, they leave you alone. But if it's not, what they tend to do is they want to assign what's called state values to your funding element in the funding formula. My experience has been that it's generally the state values are always higher than the local values. And so remember what we talked about from the system standpoint. The higher your values are, the wealthier you look, and the less state dollars they give you. So what this firm does is they come in and they, they look at our values and they appeal to the comptroller's office to have our values lowered. Now it doesn't affect individual taxpayers. It's from a systemic standpoint and from a district standpoint. And the lower they can get those values, the more state aid our district will generate. If we didn't appeal it, we would just get what we get and move on. With them appealing it, they have been highly successful. I think just about every year they've had our property values reduced. You've, you've seen the data in the packet. They generate more state dollars for our school district dollars we would not have received if they haven't stepped up and appealed the values for us. So uh, our, our recommendation is to once again hire them. Uh, they will come in after the value study is done. They'll make the appeal. Uh, if they do what they've done every year in the past, they'll get our uh, values reduced in our formulas, and our district will earn as much state aid as we possibly can. So Mr. Lehman, go from there. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. That's a a really simple explanation of a pretty difficult system, and I appreciate you doing that. But um, maybe one thing you didn't mention is how we pay Limebarger, so they, you might want to cover that as well. Sure. Their fee is contingent on additional state aid, and they receive 10% of any gain we make. Uh, over time, they've gained a lot of money. In fact, I, I think I noticed that over the last uh, 15 years or so, they had our values reduced by over a billion our values would be a billion higher today if they had not come in and appealed. So uh, they received 10% of any gain we received. Last year, we received 333,000 extra dollars, and we paid Limebarger 33,000 of those dollars. So we don't pay them unless there's, a, unless there's an appeal. Absolutely. And when there's a, an appeal, and if they win the appeal, then we get, they get 10% of, yes, of that win. Okay. So that's a pretty... Um, good return on on our investment yes. and certainly something that we wouldn't there is no cost to the district and it and it, I, I don't remember I've been on the board for 17 18 years now and I don't remember the state values ever being above local values either so um, it's it's a system set up where the state drives values higher and then we have to convince the state that our local appraisal district is more effective in understanding what true value is and then we um, the the protest comes into in that area, and then they protest the values that the state has provided, and versus what our local comp, uh, our local appraisal district has. And unfortunately, you just triggered triggered my soapbox. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, you know the the sad part of it is that our leadership continues to hammer schools because of uh, rising property taxes and. and and they're right, people are possibly getting taxed out of their homes because of this over-reliance on property taxes. 
and they have solutions like uh, tax caps and, and or you know hold the appraisals down. Those aren't going to work. And, and the thing that uh, frustrates us from a school district level is while they complain about the rising values, they send the property tax division out to each appraisal district to make them raise their values. So it, you know it's a false narrative that they're presenting there, and it's uh, school people recognize that, and we fight every year uh, to take that money, put it back in the system, compress tax rates, give us tax relief, allow us to compress tax rates, put more optional homes, put more homestead exemption money in there. Do something with that money rather than siphon it off to their pet projects. So yeah, it's very frustrating. It's very tough on our local property taxes, but the solution is with the legislature. If we can put enough pressure on them, uh, maybe they'll start listening. All right, sorry about that. And for those of you who would like to put pressure on them, um, it is a, an, a legislative year, so our legislature does meet uh, beginning in January for 140 days unless there's a special session. So if you'd like to do that, now would be a great time uh, for you to do that. So anybody have any questions or comments concerning, thanks again, Dr. Bright. That's a great uh, presentation and uh, simple enough where I can understand it. So it's gotta be uh, relatively simple. So thank you. I just, <clears throat> just one point that I, when you're talking about our legislature, our legislature's Drew Darby, he understands this. He's the one that's helped educate us on this. He just needs more help in Austin to get this done. So uh, I don't want this to sound like a criticism of Drew because I know he's, he r fully recognizes what's going on. With that, yeah. uh, with that said, I would like to make a motion that we approve the administration's recommendation for the proposal from Linebarger, Gogan, Blair, and Sampson for representation of the San Angelo Independent School District for an appeal of the Comptroller's 2018 property value study. Second. Thanks. We have a motion from Mr. Uh, Parker and a second from Mr. Gallegos uh, to approve um, the state, the firm to um, appeal the annual property value study. Uh, any other questions or comments? I, I would just second uh, Mac's comments. Uh, I'm, Drew was, um, Representative Darby was uh, selected as a, a champion of public education and we presented an award to him uh, last year. So certainly uh, Drew is a, a huge fan of, of public school systems. So um, the, the problem exists beyond uh, Representative Darby, but um, there's at least some uh, folks who think Representative Darby could potentially be the next speaker. And uh, if so, he'll have a significant more influence uh, as we move forward. So um, any other comments or questions um, concerning our motion, any public comment? Um, yes, ma'am. Go to if you go to the mic and let us know who you are. Um, we appreciate your comments. Um, it's an excellent report, but my question would be: if it's not costing anyone anyone anything, how are they paying this company? Well, we we pay them based on the award. So, if, in in Jeff's right, example, but who's paying them? They're taking their fee. Their fee is 300, so they, they saved $333,000 for the district in the last, last time they protested those numbers. So 10% of that was 33,000. So of the 333 that we should have got, we only got 333,000 333, minus the 33. I, it just. We actually cut the check from the district. That's okay. right. They'll, I, they'll, somebody they'll has up. to pay them. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Correct. We pay them based on how how well they do in in protesting and uh, in, in making our appeal for us on our behalf. Thank you. Um, item ten uh, is consider SEISD's. Oh, I'm sorry. Thanks. Yes. Go. Yes. Another question. Yes. Go forward. And if you would tell us who you are, I'd appreciate it. Yes, my name is Alexandria Sykes, and I have a seven-year-old completely blind child at Reagan with um, a terminal illness. So to say I have looked at our budget closer, okay. to say I have analyzed our budget is an understatement. I stay up until 4 a.m. analyzing it. I want to know where these funds go. 
if we're not expecting to have to pay that, obviously, we have to have the idea that just in case their investigation does not give us, or their, what is it called, their thorough, appeal. yes, yes, their appeal doesn't go through, then that 333000 that we're going to have to find the funds to pay for these property taxes, where did the funds go when we get that money back? Jeff, you want to handle that? Yeah. Okay, we, we base our revenue estimates on uh, an anticipated property value. And during the year, uh, here's the other piece. It's, it, this is where it starts getting complicated. Your, your funding is based on prior year values. So uh, we, we estimate, this will actually work for 1920 revenue, this, this, this appeal. And so we base our estimates on last year's property values, which we know. And so we know the amount of state revenue we're going to, should receive. We, we, we already know that number and it's built into the budget. It's not like uh, all of a sudden they write us an extra check for 300000 that we didn't know was coming. It's already built into the general budget. And to the projected revenue for yes, this school yes, year? Or yes. the school year coming? Yes. So where, and I know that this is taking up time, but where is the funds from the previous year allocated through the revenue area, because I have the budget paperwork over there. Can you just kind of throw me yeah. an area to look? Yeah, let me come over there and I'll show you exactly where Wonderful. it is. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments? If not, thanks, Becky, for reminding me. We, have, we need a vote. All, all, anyone, uh, all, all in favor of a motion, please indicate by saying aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion. Thank you. And now uh, item 10 is to consider Sands ISD's Head Start, Early Head Start Program imp Implementation Plan. And Ms. Taunton's here to help us with that. Good evening, Mr. Lehman, Dr. Detloff, and members of the board. Um, I have before you the uh, changes to the revised uh, implementation plan, which uh, have been revised uh, to meet the new performance standards that have come out. Uh, they've been revised in sections. Um, I gave you a handout in, that was sent to you that shows you all of the components of the implementation plan. Uh, some of them you've already approved starting last March. Um, before you today are six, um, and they all fall under uh, 1302, which is program operations. You have sub, subpart C, which is education and child development program services. Subpart D is health and program services. Subpart E is family and community engagement program services. Subpart F, additional services for children with disabilities. Subpart G, transition services and transition services. And subpart H, services for enrolled pregnant women. And all of these uh, include the statutory requirements of the Head Start Act by describing all of the program performance standards that are required to operate Head Start and Early Head Start programs. Uh, this section 1302 pro covers the full range of operations from enrolling eligible children to providing program services for the children and their families. Thank you, Ms. Taunton. Um, any questions or comments for Rachel before she? Do we have a motion to approve? Well, I'll make the motion to approve the administration's uh, recommendation for Head Start um, Parts 1302, Subpart C and H. Was that it? H. C through H. C through H. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thanks, Gerard. We have a motion from Mr. Gallegos and a second from Mr. Parker uh, to approve our Head Start and Early Head Start implement implementation plan. Uh, in section 1302, which includes subpart C, which is education and child development. Subpart D is health program services. Subpart E is family and community engagement program services. Subpart F is additional services for children with disabilities. Subpart G is transition services. And subpart H is services to enroll pregnant women. Are there any other board comments or questions concerning our motion? Any public comment? If not, all in favor of our motion, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, indicate by saying no. Our motion passes. That covers our agenda for this evening. Uh, there's some announcements. Um, 
item A on our announcements is our con upcoming uh, convention that we found out that we're going to be presenters at. So uh, hopefully uh, someone will take uh, the time to attend Dr. Uh, Ritter's presentation. Uh, that's uh, September 28th through the 30th in Austin. Um, and then our finance and pre-agenda board workshop is scheduled for October 9th. And our regular board meeting is scheduled for October 15th. Um, and I don't know if we need to go into closed session. Is there any reason for us? Okay, we don't have any reason to go into closed session. Is there any, uh, any item or um, topic that uh, any of our board team would like for us to address at a future meeting? Dr. Detloff? I just needed uh, one maybe point of clarification from Becky. Becky, what time does the bus leave for TASB? So what time do we need to be here again? One o'clock on Thursday the 27th. Okay, thank you. And Jana, when's your presentation? Dr. Ritter, when's your presentation? When's your presentation? Um, 7.30 on, the, on, yeah, on, fr on Friday? 8.35 on Friday. Okay. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> 8.45, okay. 7.30. Um, on Saturday? On Saturday. Okay. I'm going and then I'll be helping with another one with John Skinner, but I don't know what time that one is, but I can get it to you. Okay, please do so. So you'll have uh, members of our board team uh, in, in there to support you. Um, and I don't think we have any further business, so hearing no objection, we'll stand adjourned. <laughs>